In this episode of In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, brought to you by First Star Logistics, we catch up with the legend, the icon, number 14 in your program, number one in your heart, Ken Anderson, the player that Mike Brown said was the most important player in franchise history, not only the best, not only the most valuable, the most important player in franchise history. He elevated the most important position in the National Football League the play at the quarterback position. Ken Anderson, MVP, 1981 season, quarterback to our first Super Bowl, Super Bowl 16 up in Pontiac, Michigan. We'll talk about all that. We'll talk about Joe Burrow. We're going to talk about Ken Anderson's football life. I think you're going to enjoy it. Welcome once again to In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, brought to you by First Star Logistics. And we are in our beautiful studios as always. And man, Cincinnati Bengals matching up with the LA Rams in Super Bowl 56. Who would have thunk that? So I figure I better go to a guy who knows everything there is to know about the game of football. Our special guest, and I mean special in capital letters, Mr. Ken Anderson. K.A., what do you think about this? Bengals, Rams, Super Bowl 56. I think this is unbelievable, Lap, and was kind of thinking about, you know, our experience 40 years ago from doing this. And, you know, I think that the combinations will probably be a little bit different. Um, you know, if you remember, I was MVP of the league that year, and yeah. we got to the hotel, um, I think, on Monday, maybe, of the, the Super Bowl week. And, you know, we go up to our room, we grabbed our keys, because you and I roomed together, and uh, go in, and there's no bed. I said, ah. Oh, MVP, we get a suite, and we're checking the doors on either side. They're all locked, and we had a double bed you pulled out of the wall, and I said, I like you a lot, Scoose, but uh, we're not sleeping in this together. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was What do you what do you call it? A Murphy bed or whatever? You oh, something out. like that. God. Pulled down the Murphy bed. Are you kidding? And I'm thinking, what, what the heck? This is the MVP of the National Football League. Show a little respect here. <laughs> you know, I, I thought we were going to have a three-room suite or something. Oh, that was that was classic. That was great. You know, and and it's, you know, so much different back then, Dave. There's, you know, not the press conferences every day for the players. I right. mean, I think on Tuesday was media day, and and that was kind of it for us. You know, uh, until the game, the the pregame show was only a half hour. Yeah. I think pregame shows have already started now a week ahead of time. Right. You know, they they had to get the game over with, and there was no on the field presentation of the trophy because they had to get to 60 minutes on time. Right. So right. just a, a little bit different production than it, uh, than it is nowadays. I mean, the NFL, it's like, I think it's, IBM was instantaneously recognizable, you know, as now NFL is even more than that. I mean, if you say NFL internationally, you've got, you've got cachet, man. It's big. It has turned into, an unbelievable, it's not Fortune 500, it's not Fortune 50, it's like Fortune 5, it's crazy. It is an unbelievably huge business enterprise, there's no doubt. No, but it, it's, you know, and, and it's so much better. You know, I mean, obviously, Dave, when the, the TV money got big, you know, after, you know, we retired, and I think that's, you know, I'm so happy that the players get what they get now, and, uh, yep. You know, and, and, uh, and but I'm just so proud of, of our Bengals. And, you know, they're good football players, Dave, but, but it's the way that they've done it. Yeah. You know, they've done it with a, a commitment, not only to the team, but to each other. Um, they've established uh, a culture there that, you know, I, hey, if you don't want to work as hard as me, we don't need you to be here. You know, so everybody is, is all pulling together. I mean, Zach Taylor's done a, a tremendous job with this. And, you know, and it just like I say, it's nobody would have thought this uh, in August that the Bengals had a chance to go to the Super Bowl. And now here we are. And and my gosh, why can't we win this, Dave? I mean, I every I mean, team that we've played in the playoffs so far has been favored. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no different now. And we find a way to win. Absolutely. I mean, for the first time in NFL history, two number four seeds are playing each other in the, in the Super Bowl. I mean, the Bengals knocked off the number one seed, Tennessee, on the road, as you say. Knock off the number two seed, Kansas City, on the road. And now they go play the Rams, who knocked off, you know, top seeds themselves. Number four against number four. The, the thing is, the Rams are at home for the second year in a row. 
And I, I don't think the commissioner likes this very much. It doesn't seem like this sits with him very well. Last year, for the first time ever, Tampa Bay Buccaneers had home field advantage in a Super Bowl, and they won it. Now for the second straight year, you have home field advantage for the Rams. What do you think about that, K.A.? Well, you know, I, from a game standpoint, I don't think it's going to make a lot of difference because – they don't. The Rams don't control the seats. The NFL right. controls the seats. Each team's going to get the same amount. Yep. You know, so much of it is corporate. I think the real advantage is they have no travel. Sure. You know, they're staying at their own house. They're practicing yep. in their own facility. Nothing is disrupted for them. So I think you know that's a you know a big advantage because you know I mean I, I think back you know to us going to the, the Pontiac and okay well the meetings ended at night what are we going to do and I think we found. You know, there wasn't a whole lot to do around Pontiac. Right. Joe Burrow would have been really happy with that. There wasn't a whole lot to do. And I, I think we found a little pizza place about a, a mile away that had some picnic tables in it that we could go and get a couple of pitchers of beer at night, you know, right. before we turned it in. But uh, other than that, I said there wasn't anything to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about it. The Cincinnati Bengals have been in the Super Bowl three times. The first time we went in Super Bowl 16 was the coldest Super Bowl ever. I mean, it was cold. It was it was sub zero outside. Fortunately, we were in a dome, but it was the coldest Super Bowl ever. Fans still had to had to deal with that weather going to the game. And then this one, of course, Super Bowl twenty three was fine down in Miami, but you know it had the Stanley Wilson problem issue with that. Obviously, Tim Crumry shatters his leg. I mean, crazy things happen in that Super Bowl. And then this one, it's the uh, it's the most costly. Super Bowl to go to in NFL history. This going in LA, when you're talking Hollywood, man, you're talking big De Niro. It's crazy. The price of the tickets, it's nuts, isn't it? Well, I I think Dave, something's got to be done about that. I mean, the average Bengal fan can't afford to go right. to the game unless you mortgage take a second mortgage out on your house. Right. You know, tickets, uh, you know, I think face value like eighteen hundred to thirty four hundred dollars. Now you're talking about plane flights. You're talking about hotels. And and I don't know what the answer is unless you go to each team's allotment. You know, say that the Bengals get 5,000 tickets, whatever right. it is. Right. Okay. And uh, so they have a lottery with your season ticket holders. Okay. You win it. Okay. Your season ticket is $100 a game. Your Super Bowl ticket is $100. Whatever that may be. But, but give the normal fan – a chance to go this don't make it something where you got to be you know almost independently wealthy to, to get out there right right so let's talk you're you're the perfect guy to talk to about super bowls because you played in one after an mvp season 81 82 super bowl you and i broadcasted together in the in the super bowl 23 the 88 89 season and then you were on the coaching staff the pittsburgh steelers that won a super bowl as a coach so you ran the gamut when, when you're talking Super Bowl, what are biggest memories that come flashing into your mind? Wow. Um, I think ours, you know, it all started off going to the game. And, you know, there was not a, a lot of roads going in to the, the Silver Dome. And one of the main arteries was cut off because the vice president was going to the game. So, I mean, we're almost late getting there to kind of get in our normal routine, which kind of, you know, threw me off a little bit. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was very time regimented on game day that get to the stadium at, at, at this time and, you know, 10 minutes later, walk out, check the field, come back in, dressed, you know, to a, to a certain point at this. And so now all that's thrown off. And and then, you know, going, uh, you know, you're out there after pregame warm up and the introductions. OK, it's another game. Here we go. And then Diana Ross sings the national anthem. She didn't show up in Cincinnati very often. This must be a, a pretty special game. And Yep. And, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, back to ours, you know, we played in the freezer bowl and then we stayed in Cincinnati the rest of the week and practiced. And it was just as cold. Now there's no heaters, there's no heated yeah. benches. And then we didn't get as much work as I hope we could get done, yep. uh, you know, for that game. And, you know, then the, the one going to Miami, you know, it, it, I guess, you know, they had some riots going on, there's buildings burning and, that kind of stuff. And, you know, a little bit different when you're a, a broadcaster. And I guess my, my best memory of that game is uh, I had a chance to make a couple of bucks on game day playing in a, a touch football game on the beach in the morning, you know, with some other NFL love. And I'm coming right. back and got stuck in draw bridges are open. And all of a sudden I'm running late and I haven't showered, haven't changed clothes. I don't have my bag. And 
I'm a half a block from the hotel. They're loading the buses, and I, I go up to the, the bellman. Here's my car. Take it, you know, and I get on the bus, and well, nobody's going to see me on radio, and and I was still doing some stuff for Channel 12 then, and okay, well, we'll get back to the hotel where we're supposed to do it, and I got a chance to shower, put some other clothes on, and they decided they're going to do it from the stadium after the game. I said, oh, man, I'm screwed now. So that was, you know, besides the outcome of the game, and then I think, you know, Bill Walsh and I were, were so close, and I, I managed to get down, you know, in the 49ers locker room, and it was kind of after everybody had left a, a little bit since I was going to stick around the stadium for Channel 12 anyway. And, and Bill was in the shower by himself and just looked drained. He looked miserable. And I, I kind of knew right then that this was going to be his last one. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, so as a coach preparing for the Super Bowl, what what's that process like? I mean, do you try to just stay on the same routine that you did every single week and don't change anything? Don't overthink too much. Don't try to reinvent yourself and all that sort of thing. How do you approach it as a coach? You know, Mike Tomlin did did a great job. He didn't ask anything more of the players during the week that, than they would have. So, you know, we didn't have, you know, meetings necessarily at night. We would stay uh, out. I think we were practicing at South Florida's facility. So after practice, you know, we would go in and we'd watch the game film and then when they would get back to the hotel, they'd have dinner and then they're free for the night. Um, you know, coaches, we still had our, our nightly stuff that, that that we were doing, but tried to to stick to the routine, you know, as, as much as possible. And it gets thrown off a little bit because, you know, at least at that time, every day during lunch hour were media responsibilities, right, right. which you normally, you know, don't have during during the regular season. And, and I, I, I remember... <laughs> Again, you talk about stupid memories of this, that, uh, you know, our assistant coaches didn't talk to the media unless it was okayed by the, the head coach. You know, coordinators could. And, and so I'm at, at Friday's practice, and Andrea Kramer comes up to me and said, hey, I heard uh, Ben went in and had his ribs x-rayed uh, last night. I said, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. You know, I, and then I, I'm running back. I said, you never heard anything from me. I can't talk to the coaches, you know. And uh, – so then uh, Saturday night, we go to our undisclosed team hotel. And, of course, there's five satellite trucks outside our undisclosed location. And, you know, the, the day of the Super Bowl is a, a long day. And so I'm out taking a, a walk. And here comes, I think it was Ed Werner. And he, I, I, he's a block away. Hey, Kenny, how's Ben? I said, he's fine. <laughs> well, I go back and I turn on the TV and they go to a live shot there. Of course, big, real concern today about Ben Roethlisberger. Rumor has he's, he's He's, uh, you know, he's got broken ribs, you know, and Ron Jaworski said, well, we just talked to Kenny Anderson. And, you know, I know Kenny really, if he says he's fine, he's fine. I went, oh, my God, Ben's going to be pissed off at me, the head coach. I was a wreck. Of course, nobody said anything to me. So that, you know, I, I was a mess until we got to the kickoff. And, and of course, the way the, the, the game went, you know, okay, hey, we were at lead. We're finally going to get it done. And Larry Fitzgerald goes about 80 the other day to take the lead. And yeah. we're in a two-minute drill to win it. And, of course, you know, Roethlisberger to San Antonio at, at the end did it. Man, what a catch. What a throw and what a catch. That yeah. play, I mean, every 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 single year, that, that play makes it. That play makes the highlight tape. It's got to. I mean, that, that was execution at its finest, that play, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, no, there's no question about it. And, you know, if you remember back, you know, that year, Ben had a, a tremendous year that year. And I don't oh. know how many two-minute dr drives during the, the year that, that he took us down and, and scored when it was, was necessary. And you know, with that one, uh, you know, get the ball in the 20, the first play is a holding penalty. So now it's not 80, it's 90, you know, and he kept making the plays and, you know, and, uh, you know, we had a, you know, a real good football team that yeah. year, but it's, you know, every game is uh, to a certain extent, unless you go back to the, oh, maybe a Joe Flacco, maybe a Trent Dilfer, you know, that won Super Bowls because their defense was so dominant. But, you know, you got to have a quarterback to win a quarterback that's good under pressure and, and we've got one of those in Cincinnati with Joe. We sure do real quick before we get to Joe. And I want to talk to you about Joe, obviously what, what do you think are one or two traits as Ben Roethlisberger has announced his retirement officially? What are the one or two things that made Ben Roethlisberger so great? Well, you know, I, I think that, uh, my gosh, you know, by that time he, he was, you know, a veteran. He was still young, but he was still a veteran. But he'd already been to a couple Super Bowls, you know, so it wasn't too big for him. And, you know, when you play in Pittsburgh, you don't play at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. 
you know, you're playing Sunday night, you're playing Monday, you're playing Thursday after, you know, you're getting the big game of the week every week that we were there that year, which was, right. you know, great exposure for the players, but it was wrecked havoc on the, the coaches trying to prepare for the next week, uh, the, the way that it, that it went. But, um, you know, and, and he was just, uh, you know, had great leadership qualities. Um, guys, you know, believed in him the way that our team believes in Joe, that he could pull it out for us. And more times than not in his prime, he did. So with Joe, high school, college, National Football League, he's gotten to the championship level, state championship. You know, he lost the game in a shootout. Both teams scored over half a hundred, and Joe put up crazy numbers. And then he makes a run in the uh, college football playoffs and, you know, wins a national title and he wins a Heisman Trophy, first pick in the draft. Now he's the first guy to do all of that. And then in his second year, potentially win a Super Bowl or even go to a Super Bowl. No other quarterback had done that, all, all of those things. It always – it seems like like the playoffs this year, same thing in college and high school. The bigger the game, the bigger the moment – Better, the more he steps up, I mean, his heart rate seems to stabilize or even go down. What, what does that take, Kenny? What what is that? How do you how do you basically form that characteristic? How do you do it? Well, I think you know a couple things, Dave. One is going through it before, and as you mentioned, certainly you know at the high school level. I mean, you know, playing in the SEC championship game is a big enough game, you know, at all, and then go through you know two college playoff games and, right. and win it all. Um, I think the next thing is preparation. And, and I know in, in my career, when I was calm, calmest is when I knew that my preparation for the game was ready to go. I, I, there was nothing I, I'd left unturned. Um, I was prepared for any situation and I could relax. And, you know, there's always those games in a career. I'm going, oh, geez, did I, you know, should I watch a little more tape this week? But, you know, then that's when you kind of get uh, a little bit nervous and, and his preparation and what he does is, uh, you know, is tremendous. And then, then, you know, he expects the same thing of his teammates. And right. they see how hard he works. And they're not afraid, you know, the veterans to say, you don't want to work that hard. We don't need you here. You know, and, and I, I thought one of the great comments by Zach going into the playoffs was one of the reporters said, well, you got to ask the players to turn it up a notch. Playoffs are starting. He says, no, our players have turned it up a notch all year. Yep. The way that they prepare, he said, I don't have to ask them to do anymore. And again, that goes back to a, a great coaching job. Absolutely. And I will vouch for the fact that, man, you, you know, you're you're a very analytical guy. You're you're unbelievable, you know, head for math and just being being very, very uh, you know, organized, logical, man. And you put in the time. I mean, I can remember vividly you you had your nose in that playbook and, and game plan all the time. I mean. And, and people don't understand that. You know, it, it's, it's, um, God bless you guys with great ability, but you still have to work and work hard to get to the level you want to get to. And you did, and Joe's doing it. it, it and it's, it has to be that way, right? Well, yeah. And, and I, I remember back then, um, when, uh, you know, computers were not on your phone or, or a laptop, they took up rooms. And, right. you know, I, I would get a, a computer reports and they come in big binders, you know, and they're about two inches thick. You know, and I would scour through those, you know, looking, boy, is there a front that they uh, like to run different coverages by? What down to this? You know, so I, I'm pouring through all that. You know, now it's a little bit easier to, to spit it out. Yep. Um, I can't go to my iPad and, and watch all the film that I want. I mean, I had a, a 16 millimeter projector and, and I would literally take home the cans of 16 millimeter film and, and show it on the wall to get ready. Yep. Now, I, I didn't put you through that, uh, you know, in our room. Our suite, this is too much, <laughs> yeah, right. but, uh, you know, but it was going down to our team meeting room where I could get a projector set up and I could watch film down there as well. Yeah. So Joe's uh, approach to the game, uh, it, it's he, he, his family is all football. You know, his dad was a defensive coordinator, skins on the wall, great coach, did it for a lot of years. A couple of brothers played defense, uh, played linebacker at a high level at Nebraska. I mean, it, it, it is a football family. And Joe, I mean, he football to him is the contact is a big part of it. And when he was in, in the situation he was in up at Ohio State, he asked Urban Meyer if he could cover kickoffs, you know, to, to be part of it. And Urban Meyer was like, eh, you know, no. But he wanted to go down and cover kickoffs. So he has kind of like a linebacker mentality as such uh, at, the, at the quarterback position. 
Do you think that that type of approach, you think teammates feed off of that? He's a football player, Dave. You yep. know, he's not just a quarterback, and some people may uh, mistakenly label quarterbacks as prima donnas. Yep. But, uh, you know, what, Joe got hit a lot last year, suffered, a, you know, a tremendous knee injury, and his teammates saw how hard he worked to get back. And they saw how hard he works, you know, not only mentally, but physically, you know, getting ready for a game. And, you know, I think you and I have talked about this before that, you know, if you look at all the quarterbacks in the NFL, I mean, he doesn't have the strongest arm. He's not as mobile or as fast as a lot of the quarterbacks. But last week, what did he make? Four big runs for yep. first downs? Yep. And I kind of go back, uh, you know, to our AFC championship game. You know, I mean, I had three scrambles up the middle you know, uh, for three big first downs in, in that game. That's kind of, you know, he can make those plays. He can escape pressure, and his eyes are so focused downfield uh, that, you know, that he makes plays. And, you know, I, I, again, you know, kind of quoting Zach, he says, we don't want to curtail that too much because he makes magic happen. Yeah, well, I remember the your MVP season, Kenny, and, you know, obviously you know this, but I'm just saying for everybody else here listening and watching, you were our second leading rusher on that football team. You know, the 1981-82 football team. Pete Johnson was number one. You rushed for well over 300 yards, closer to 400, as, as I recall, yeah. and made and made a lot of big plays with your feet and your legs. And, I mean, what you you ran at least a 4.6, didn't you? You you could run. Well, it, was, it was more like a 4.7, and it was uh, it was really nice because in those days they, they you know, always clocked you in mini camp, you know, right. for your 40 time. Right. And uh, so I'm getting up there in, in age, and, and Paul Brown was still had his stopwatch there, you know, and, and I'd finish running it, you know, and he goes, ah, four seven still. Now the other coaches may have it at four eight, four eight five, but Paul's watch. All right, that's the one that counts. Four seven, baby. Uh, so how, a quarterback that can do that, and Stafford has, you know, enough athletic ability to do that kind of thing. But th this guy, the thing that separates Stafford, I mean, when you watch him, Kenny, this this guy has extreme arm talent. He can make any throw that needs to be made. Doesn't can he? Oh, no question about it. And you talk about a team that's got weapons. Yeah. You know, they've got offensive weapons, you know, a, as well. And, you know, you kind of listen to the the pundits, you know, and, and well, they got a big, better offensive line. They got a better defensive line than, than the Bengals have. You know, they're heavy favorites in this game. And I'm thinking back, didn't they say that last week in the AFC Championship game? Yep. Uh, didn't they say that against the Tennessee Titans? Their offensive and defensive lines are better. And it, the first game against the Raiders, weren't they saying that the rate, you know, and it doesn't make any difference to our guys. You know, like I said, hey, listen, we're, we're tired of the underdog role. We got a good football team and we got good players. And that belief in yourself and in your team goes a long, long way. I remember it was blessed to be uh, on the football field as a player and watching you and Isaac Curtis perform magic. I mean, I remember those big arching bombs down the football field. Ken Anderson and Isaac Curtis just dropped in perfectly, you know, just dropped from the heavens right into Isaac Curtis's hands. And Isaac, world-class speed, but could run routes, get in and out of cuts, sink his hips. I mean, just incredible player. You and Isaac, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, what kind of comparisons do you see there? Can, compare and contrast that. Well, you know, it's it's a little tough because, you know, I, I'm going to go on record. I've done this for, you know, for so many years that Isaac Curtis is the best receiver the Bengals have ever had. I agree. Now, he doesn't have the statistics because, you know, we were only throwing the ball 18, 20, 22 times a game. Yep. But he's averaging, you know, 8, 10 touchdown passes a game. If and he were playing – in, in, <laughs> Right. If he were playing in, in this system uh, in the NFL today, um, you know, he would have gaudy statistics. Uh, I love Jamar. You can tell the confidence that uh, that he and Joe have in each other. It's third down to 17. They want to play man-to-man. -man. Eh, back shoulder, Jamar, first down. Yep. You know, uh, they were playing for the back shoulder. We're going up top. You know, they just the rapport that they have. But then you take it a step farther. You know, they want to take away him. Well, we got T. Higgins. We're going to take care of those two. Whoa, there's Tyler Boyd. Oh, we got C.J. Uzama. We got Joe Mixon coming out of the back. We got Perrine, uh, Pringo, you know, making the, the screen pay, you know, for a touchdown. Yep. You know, so the Bengals, you know, they got a cadre of, of weapons that is second to none. No doubt. I mean, their their skilled players are exactly that. I mean, highly, highly skilled players. Let me ask you that, Kenny. 
a, a lot of talk about you know uh, the extra sensory perception ESP going on between Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase when Jamar knows where Burrow's going to throw the ball before he throws it, and Burrow knows that Jamar knows. That's when it's something special. You had that with Isaac and others too. Is that just thousands of reps, or how does that come about? No, I know it is, and, and, and a lot of it is trust. You know, for a wide receiver, okay, I know, you know, you kind of get the, the quarterback, you look at the release. Yep. If I win on the release and I'm even or I'm top, the ball goes up on top. If I don't win, it's going to be a back shoulder. Yep. Well, the receiver knows that, but, uh, you know, he doesn't trust it sometimes, and he doesn't sell the go. He tries to lean into that back shoulder early, and it doesn't work out. Where these guys just trust each other, Okay, I know what he's going to do. I know what Joe's going to do. Let me go ahead and sell this. He'll make the throw, you know, and it turns into to big plays. So as a as a great quarterback, MVP quarterback, Super Bowl quarterback, and uh, coach in the National Football League, when you watch the Bengals' offense schematically, do you like what you see? No question about it. No question about it. And I think, you know, what, what they've done is, is they've relied a lot on, on Joe. And he covers up for a lot. And I think the one difference between the 81 team and, and this team was the offensive line that we had. I mean, we had one of the best, you know, offensive lines in the league. And these guys, I, I think you will agree, um, have come a long way uh, in the last couple of months. You know, right. and even though you give up nine sacks against Tennessee, and I think even Joe would admit that some of those were his. But again, mm -hmm. it's trying to make the play. Right. Um you know, so but but you know, they they've got like I say, he's got the, the moxie and, and the savvy that he can kind of overcome some of the deficiencies in an offense. When you look at this at this Super Bowl matchup, the Rams, I, it's it's a perfect team, I think, for Hollywood because they have some star power, you know. I mean, they were good at quarterback with Goff, but they wanted to be great. So Stafford has to be traded from the Lions and the and uh, the Rams said, we'll put all the chips in and hey, bring them over here. You know, in, in Cooper Cup, before I get too far into it, give me your evaluation to Cooper Cup. This guy does never, he, he won't go out of bounds. He wants to score a touchdown every time he catches the football. This guy wants to go to the house. He's unbelievably aggressive, man. What, isn't he from Eastern Illinois? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Eastern Washington, I oh, think. Okay, what, what, what yeah. was that a big time school? Put it right, that way. Exactly, exactly. And, but, you know, you listen to what they talk about him and, and, and some of the, the veteran receivers in the media that come, just how he understands technique and how to set up a, a defensive back with their leverage to get to where he wants to go. And so I mean, he really is a, a, a technician out there. But that, again, that comes from studying. That comes from hard work. So, but, you know, boy, give him all the credit in the world. But, you know, you don't have that many catches unless you got a quarterback that can get it to you, too. It kind of reminds me when you're talking like that, Charlie Joyner. I mean, that, that was Charlie Joyner, right? I mean, there's some similarities there. Charlie ends up being a coach as well and just understood, you know, all the nuances of playing the receiver position. Uh, that He was he was a great one. So well, you, Danny, you got, Danny Ross. Danny Ross, you know, yeah. As good at working leverage as uh, any receiver we've ever had was at the tight end. Yep, no no doubt. So you, you look at you look at the star power there, you know OBJ offensively, and and you know with with what they got with Stafford and and Cooper Cup, and then defensively, you, you might have two of the best pass rushers at their positions in NFL history, Aaron Donald and Von Miller. Von Miller is the number one more sacks than any active player in the National Football League, and Aaron Donald is a freak, you know. And then and then Jalen Ramsey on the back end. Those three guys might be the best at their position, you know, one of the best ever playing the league. And they got all these stars. So you look at it and you say, yeah, the Bengals are underdogs. What's it take to beat them, Kenny? Well, you know, I, I think, Dave, at least for me, and, you know, I go back to the days of, uh, you know, San Diego and Big Hands Johnson and Louis Kelcher, two really good interior defensive linemen. And I think that's the toughest thing for a quarterback is quick pressure up the middle. So how we can – you know, at least neutralize Aaron Donald uh, initially. Yep. You know, the wide rusher, you know, you can – the tackles and you even play some tackle. You know, you can, you know, use your technique to push him around, let the quarterback, you know, step up. But, you know, give me a place to step up and don't give me that quick, you know, whiff uh, on, on the inside. Now i got to make a move before I'm ready to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think – correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're the quarterback. 
there's time and then there's space. I always felt like give Kenny Anderson not just time, but if you give him space and you don't obstruct his view and you let him look at the field so he can, you know, just diagnose it, he's going to dissect it if he diagnoses it. Is that pretty much the case? Oh, no, there's no question about it. You know, and, and, and Joe has shown that anticipation. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of times a quarterback, you, you kind of know where you're going to go with the football, uh, you know, at the line of scrimmage. You know, at least for me, I'd still go through my progression. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, if, I've got, if I'm working right to left, you know, after my first step, you know, number one on the right's already gone, I'm already inside. Uh, you know, on my third step, I already know I'm going to go backside on time. So, you know, then that just comes from from doing it. And Joe's got a great feel for that. So you mentioned Bill Walsh. Um, in, in your estimation, to have a guy like Bill Walsh in the, in the infancy stages of your career, how fortunate were you? Oh, no question. I mean, it was the basis of, of my 16-year career, and it was the basis of my 17-year coaching career. You know, if you think back to those days, the – the, the depth of the quarterback's drop and the depth of the receiver's routes were not necessarily all in sync. And, and Bill started to do that. You know, that, okay, I got a, a quick three for a, a certain route. Now I got a three, a big three and a hole to let a slant carry, you know, get to the second window. Um, you know, I got a quick five. I got a five, no hitch. I got a deep five and a hitch. You know, I got a seven step. All, all the play action have, you know, all that footwork, you know, we worked on, you know, tremendously. And you know, my, my first training camp, you know, we only had six coaches and a head coach, you know, so Bill coached, you know, quarterbacks, wide receivers, and tight ends. And so we would get our work done at lunch hour that we'd go have a bite to eat and go get dressed again. And we're out on the field working on our quarterback techniques before the team came out for our afternoon practice. But, right. you know, that and, and, and teach me how to use my eyes and the protections and where you're hot, how you can fix it or where my hot throw is going to be. And, so, and then it was not only at that time, you know, the NFL was a big vertical passing game. You know, it, it's uh, Daryl LaMonica, the mad stork, you know, get a fast guy, throw it long, you know, quarterback's completion percentage is we're right around 50%, you know, in that era. But with Bill, we were going to use the whole field, not only vertically, but horizontally. We had a progression to go to. If we didn't have the matchup that we'd like going deep, we'll take the running back for three or four yards and stay ahead of the chains. You know, uh, we weren't, you know, we weren't just indiscriminately going to go ahead and, and throw the ball up for, up for grabs. It was uh, we want a high completion percentage and we want very few turnovers. So I guess a two part question with your Super Bowl experience. What's the biggest piece of advice that you can give any player as they get ready for the Super Bowl? And then most specifically to a quarterback or would the advice be the same? I, I think it's it's the same for all of them. It, it's uh, it's you go into this and, and, and you know it's different because of the hoopla around it. But, you know, I, I think the thing is trust what you've done all year. You know, what you've done to get ready for every other game is good enough to get ready for this game. You know, don't try to do more than you've done all year. You don't need to do more. You know, what you've got in the tank is plenty to win any football game you play in. And I think, you know, Dave, we've all been there that sometimes you, you know, I feel I got to do more. I got to do more. Well, you know, you don't have to do your job, you know, trust everyone else to do their job and just execute the way you've done all year and be fine. And I'll get you out of here on this one, Kenny, and appreciate all your time, my man. And this was unbelievable. This was great. At, from a coaching standpoint, what would your advice be? I mean, my thinking would be, all right, don't try to reinvent the wheel. You have some core principles, maybe like the great Paul Brown said, make different things look similar, make the same things look different. You know, just a little salt and pepper, a few sprinkles here and there. What do you think? I mean, is it not, not don't introduce too much. I mean, just keep it simple, stupid kind of deal. Well, no, I, I think, you know, we've got a great offense, a diversified offense, you know, and, but I, I think, you know, Dave, you know, you've got the extra time. If you put a play or two in, a wrinkle or two in, that's fine. And you can't wholesale change it because you can't rep it. Right. You know, I, I remember, you know, one time, gosh, and I think I was coaching in Pittsburgh. And, you know, we got a tight red zone play. And boy, we saw this coverage they're playing. We put a play and we hadn't ever run. We've just just for this team. Well, you get to throw it three times. And, you know, every time from the 10-yard line, we saw this coverage. Every time. 
they gave us a different coverage and Ben hadn't seen that coverage and throws an interception. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, don't do anything that you haven't had a chance to work on repeatedly. And uh, so I, that, that's kind of, you know, my advice. Like I say, if you have a wrinkle or two, you can get enough reps on it in practice against different coverages, you know, that you may get a big play out of it, but, but don't change wholesaling. Right. Right. And I guess, uh, you know, you're thinking, all right, there's no tomorrow. So if you have, have a gadget or a gimmick play or something in the, in the, in your pocket still think about it, but uh, those only work. It, element of surprise has to be a big thing with uh, gadget gimmicks. You just don't go out there and run them for the sake of running them, right? Well, it's, it, you got to get a feel for what the, the right situation for it. And and I yeah. think that Zach's done a, you know, a real good job that, you know, that little jet sweep on, on fourth and one, the, the Jamar yep. chase. Well, you know, wow, what, what a neat looking play. They had something else called when they see the look, let's go to this. They hadn't run it in the game before, but they had repped it a bunch in practice for a couple of months before they did it. So right. well, I, I forget what coach it was. And said, I'm never going to run a gadget play unless we've worked on it for about two months, you know, <laughs> and they've, they've got enough in, in their bag that they, you know, that they can come up with uh, some plays that maybe they haven't seen that just, they haven't got had a chance to run them you know, in a game yet. And, you know, it's always it's a final, final thought here. And I promise this time <laughs> uh, in the, in the Super Bowl, and in, in the AFC championship game, it happened a big play made by a guy that you didn't anticipate Trent Taylor with the two point conversion. I mean, Trent Taylor had not been involved offensive at all. He, he's the guy that has that run, you know, motions yep. and runs the route and catches the two point uh, BJ Hill making the interception on a screen pass, tipping it to himself. Somebody who you least expect might step up in a Super Bowl and make a huge play, right? It, it happens a lot. Oh yeah. And, and, and that's what, you know, the confidence I have in this team, you know, when we saw the screen, it wasn't Joe Mixon that ran for that first touchdown, you know, uh, it was, you know, another running back, but he was ready for that moment. And, and, and our guys, you know, and I don't care if you're number one on the depth chart, if you're number four, you know, these guys are, are ready to play. And, you know, just the, the little things, you know, you kind of read about, you know, and the, you know, where the defensive backs have organized that little breakfast, you know, on, on yeah. their off day to, to come in and watch a little extra film, get a little extra workout in. You know, these guys are doing the little extra things in preparation. Just keep doing those things. You'll be ready to go this Sunday. Absolutely. I mean, the players are committed. The coaches coach them up. Man, it's it's been an unbelievable chemistry and culture. You know, it all sounds trite and whatever, but it's it's a fact, man. You have to have it to go where, to get where you need to be and compete at this level. There's no question about yeah, it. And I think the, the critical guy, I think, uh, might be Jeff Brickner, the business manager. Yeah. Make sure that there's no pull out beds from the walls on this this trip. <laughs> you got to check all those rooms, Dave, ahead of time. I hear you. Do a walkthrough. <laughs> <laughs> Denny, unbelievable as always. Appreciate you. Love talking football with you. You're a good man. You're a hell of a football player, even better person. You're the man. Well, thanks, Dave. And, and I, gosh, it's, it's killing me that I'm not going to be able to make it to the game and Kind of talked to my my back surgeon about it, and he said, "Could you maybe do it?" Well, yeah. Is it the smart thing to do? No. He said, "I don't want to see you back here in a couple of years. I don't. In fact, I don't want to see you back again. Uh, I know it's eating at you, but do the right thing uh, to make sure that this thing heals right." So I'm, I'm putting a lot on you now. You know, <laughs> you know, we're not rooming together on, on the All road right. anymore, but I'm counting on you to bring this one home for us. I got you, Coach. And one last thing. Yeah, we can't we can't not talk to you without asking you about the Ken Anderson Alliance. You do such unbelievable stuff, Kenny. You're you, you're there are two. Uh, we, we talked to Mark Duffner um, uh, on a podcast, and he had a great comment. There are givers and takers. You, my man, are an ultimate giver, and the Ken Anderson Alliance is is a, just a, a great example of what you're doing. Not not just the community, but a, but an a community that covers the entire country and even internationally or whatever. Tell us about what's going on with the Ken Anderson Alliance. Well, you know, we're, we're trying to make a difference in the lives of adults with disabilities, Dave. And, you know, uh, you know, we've got our Just Brew coffee shop at our corporate office uh, out on Plainfield Road uh, on Silverton. Uh, stop by. The, it is great. You know, we've got 14 adults working in there. Two of our adults are managers. Uh, we're going to open up four more this coming year. One of them at Children's Hospital. So that's an exciting thing. Um, I think what we got going on right now is it's called 14K in 14 days. We're trying to raise 14,000 in 14 days 
And the way that you do it is you go to KenAndersonAlliance.org and you buy a ticket. I think you get maybe one for $14. You can buy them $140. You can buy it $1,400. You see the 14 in there, Dave? I got it. Got the uh, and then we're, we're going to draw um, uh, for different things that you can win. Um, one of them is, uh, you remember the game ball that uh, I think it was Coach Simmons that uh, took out the 16 lots? It had the wrong date on it. Yep. Well, the Bengals saw that, gave him another ball with the correct date on it. We've got the one-of-a-kind ball with the wrong date. That would be one of the prizes. How about it? Um, I've got an old uh, throwback helmet, you know. I don't think you ever played with the webbing in the helmet. Did You always had padding when you came here, didn't you? Wait. But these are the ones with the webbing inside the helmet. Did that have um, a face mask on it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, a face it mask. wasn't leather either, <laughs> Lapham. Um, but I've signed that. You can't buy these helmets anymore. That's one of them. And then That's we've awesome. got uh, a specialty bottle of, of bourbon from the New Rift Distillery that kind of honors me going into the Ring of Honor. So those are the things you can buy tickets for. And like I say, 14K in 14 days. And I'm proud to announce today that we're already halfway there. That's awesome. And I'll tell you what. It's not a ring of honor unless Ken Anderson is the first inductee or one of the first. And it happened. So in my mind, it's officially a ring of honor because you are the franchise, my man, Kenny Anderson. Well, thank you, Dave. And like I say, um, as soon as you come back a winner, you got to hook me up with Joe Brown. I've yet to meet him. I, so hopefully this off season, you know, I'll get a chance. And then maybe you and I, uh, he and I can go out and we can share a beer and tell some stories. There you go. That'd be awesome. Take care of yourself. Take care of your back. Hope every, it sounds like everything's progressing the way you want it to and uh, keep it going that direction, my man. Well, I, I tell you, life's good, Dave. When I just had uh, a, a two-year-old granddaughter and a seven-year-old granddaughter over here sp spending the night with, with Christy and I, that was uh, the best night I've had in a, a long, long time. And, you know, just makes me appreciate uh, the, the things that we have, the life that we have. You know, appreciate your friendship, which, gosh, goes back to the, the mid-70s when you first showed up from Syracuse. Um, so, like like I say, it, it, it's life's good, but it could be a little bit better. And that uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll get that, uh, uh, you know, coming up, uh, you know, next Sunday, you know, when the Bengals uh, lay one on the L.A. Rams. That would be great, man. A victory in Super Bowl 56 is the cherry on top of those grandchildren. You know, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing better than grandchildren, man. Life's good. You're the best, Kenny Anderson. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Take care of yourself, my man. You got it, brother. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. <laughs> Brakes? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You know, yeah. you know you got to get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out FirstStarLogistics.com.